Thomas Storitz. I, I do want to welcome you all here tonight. Um, it's a special day. Um, if you aren't aware, today is the 199th birthday for <laughs> Fanny Appleton Longfellow. <laughs> so we, we sort of strategically actually picked that day, uh, or today for today's talk. Um, because this isn't the only celebration of Fanny Longfellow that we're going to be doing over the next year. Um, there's going to be a lot of Fanny. Originally, I wanted to call it the summer of Fanny, but now it seems to have expanded to a year or so of Fanny, so we'll see how it all turns out. But we're going to have a lot of wonderful programming, and Diana was gracious enough to agree to kick off that uh, year of very special celebration of, of Fanny's life. <coughs> Uh, this is also the first program of what will be seven consecutive uh, Thursdays of lectures here in the Carriage House. There will be six after tonight. Um, on your way out tonight, there is a schedule by the door. If you didn't receive one in the mail, you can grab one of those. Um, so it, it should be a, a wonderful month and a half or so of programming here. But about tonight's program, um, as I mentioned, Diana was gracious enough uh, to kick off the celebration of Fanny's life. And uh, I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm sure some of you um, are familiar with Diana. Um, Dr. Diana Korsnick is a painter. She is um, an author as well. She, her, her book, Drawn to Art, A 19th Century American Dream, won the Boston Globe's L.L. Winship Award in 1986 for the best book by a New England writer on a New England topic. She is Professor Emerita at the Massachusetts College of Art. She also has a very long history here with the house. She was the founder and is the, or was the first president of the Friends of Longfellow House Washington's headquarters. And if you've ever been to any of our programs here at the site, you hear me thank them still today for, um, before almost every one of them for the support that they do provide the site. And for more than two decades, she has been researching, teaching, and writing about our subject tonight, Fanny Appleton Longfellow. And we decided that, or Diana um, thought, suggested, that since we're beginning the celebration of Fanny's birthday tonight, that we should start with the story of Fanny from the very beginning. And so we will be looking at her early years, by trying to find Fanny's roots. So if you would please join me in welcoming Dr. Diana Corson. some of that to you. I'm not using slides because I'm a sl slide phobic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you have these handouts and I want to tell you what's what on the handouts so when I'm speaking about the various images you can turn to your packet and see what's what. First of all, this scrumptious cover photograph is what Fanny would have seen looking out the door of 39 Beacon Street. This was ripped from the web. But when I saw it, and I saw the tree image and the root <coughs> metaphor with the shadow, I said, that's the cover picture. So that's 39 Beacon Street. When I talked about the fan glass over the door, that's the fan glass I'm talking about. It's still there. If you turn over, there are four portraits. The top two are Fanny's mother, Maria Teresa Appleton, uh, Gold Appleton, and Nathan Appleton. You're going to hear a lot about them tonight. They were both painted by Gilbert Stewart, 
and I have come upon letters of actually Maria sitting for Gilbert Stewart, what it was like to sit for him and listen to him talk while he was painting. <laughs> Those portraits are in the house now. And the woman who accompanied Maria to the sittings, because no woman could be alone with a man in his studio, was this woman, Eloise Payne, painted by Samuel Morse, who was a family friend of the Payne family. And um, so she was the sort of chaperone in the studio. And this is Fanny. Approximately the age I bring her up to tonight. We'll be talking about her up to 16. Yeah. What year was this, please? Which? Well, the marriage portraits are about 1806 or 1808. There's some years in between. This is probably about 1812. Okay. And this is undated. I that, that was. When you said that she couldn't go unaccompanied, I wondered what you were talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're talking about... Very happy all yeah. the single ladies here tonight can come unaccompanied. <laughs> 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 now, finally, let's talk about these structures, because we're talking a lot about houses tonight. And you may want to make some notes. The New Ipswich house, you see where the New Ipswich on the chart over there? The red house is the Appleton family house, built in 1759, still standing in New Ipswich, New Hampshire. This is the gold family mansion in Pittsfield, no longer standing. I'm going to refer to that later. This is the New Ipswich Academy that I will be talking about. This tiny little house produced more distinguished Americans in the first decades of the 20th century than one would believe possible. Um, this is 54 Beacon Street in the middle, bottom. That's the house that Fanny was born in. Very elegant, four-story, very dangerous, treacherous, steep stairway. Not <laughs> ideal for having a whole bunch of children. Mm -hmm. And so Nathan saw to it that they had a more expansive, wider house. And that's number 39. <laughs> so that sort of plot where we're going. Now I'll read and I'll be sort of extemporaneous as I inevitably will be. Okay. <laughs> when I was asked to give this talk tonight, I was asked to set the stage for appreciation, as Garrett said, of a year-long commemoration of the 200th anniversary of Fanny's, Fanny Appleton Longfellow's birth. Um, I thought that had, our law had asked me to focus on her youth, but maybe I suggested it, because <laughs> I love the subject of her youth. All you hear tonight pertains to her up to the age of 16. Although she was the daughter of a prodigiously wealthy father and wife of an internationally famous poet, these hardly seem reasons to celebrate her. So you may ask, why Fanny? She wrote no great American novel, produced no great paintings, financed no entrepreneurial activities. But she did something I find exceedingly rare and much needed, and I hope accessible in our time. And I hope her work will engage you. She was wrestling with herself and her maker in private encounters, in writing, inventing a way to survive, creating her own life raft. This is all very cryptic, but you will understand as I say more. You need a life raft when you cannot walk on water. Most of us cannot walk on water. Fanny started to build hers when she was still a child. Her father demanded that all his children master their pens, and she anxiously and eagerly complied. Her first surviving written words are date from 1823 or 24, where she was writing Tom, her oldest sibling. In an immature script, the six-year-old Fanny wrote Tom, 
You quote, you must not expect me to write well as I do not know how to write letters. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back from childhood through her too short life, she lived only to age 44, we see that Fanny wrote hundreds of letters to friends and family. Many are archived at this site, at this park, and they are in libraries all across the country. But it is with another kind of writing that she launched her life raft. This work was a private meditation which enga engaged her, perhaps to her amazement, for 20 years. In my process of devoting two decades, also 20 years, to researching and collecting and describing, transcribing the Appleton Longfellow family letters, the, our subject tonight has become an in, in, intimate acquaintance of mine. The contents of these letters, journals, and the metadata records of my developing understanding now fill some 60 binders in my house. The more I read of Fanny Appleton's private writings from childhood through maturity, the more I sympathize with her, the more I respect her, and the more I am in awe of her process. In her work, I found a focus I have yearned for in my life, and that focus has changed my life. I came to know that despite the many advantages with which this 19th century young woman had been blessed, in her writing, she preferred to keep private. She willingly admitted to and grappled with what she did not know. And embracing not knowing, she resisted being complacent or self-indulgent. She asked big questions about her inner life, about how people can relate to one another. She recorded troubles and surprises and tried to deal with each. In what she called a selfish doubt, she asked if, quote, our intricate and peculiar nature can be understood and appreciated by another, unquote. This is not only a big question, it's a spiritual question. Again, all you will hear tonight pertains to young Fanny, how her family history and her childhood led her to develop her way of praying on paper. For starters, let's look at Fanny's meeting her nation's history. We can see her at seven, still getting accustomed to living in her family's new home, 39 Beacon, which you have on your sheets. Looking out those elegant front windows of 39 Beacon Street, she saw something strange. There were crowds of men, militia they called them, from all across the states gathering on her Boston County. She watched the men set up tents and march through their routines. Someone must have told her why the men were here. They were here to co commemorate her nation's jubilee, jubilee year. That is why Fanny and the other children were told to sport baby blue ribbons, named the name of Lafayette across their clothes. Mm. Everyone here had come to greet the Revolutionary War hero, the Marquis de Lafayette. Who would have it happened to come to Boston twice, processing up Beacon Street in a golden chariot drawn by four white horses. Imagine a child seeing this. Lafayette waved to the aged soldiers who saw him in awe and to the young wife, Fanny, who had no idea why he was here. All this history was confusing and it was contested. Some still doubted that the revolution had been a good idea. That's why then President James Monroe, who took office in the year of Fanny's birth, sought to build national loyalty by inviting from France the now aged beloved Lafayette to bestow his blessings on the American experiment. Fanny admitted, and even worried that, as her parents occasionally did, that she felt an unnatural affinity for things British. But such were the challenges of social station, of their social station in a raucous democracy. Fanny Appleton's personal history begins in, as you heard, October 6, 1817, 
When her parents, Maria Teresa Gold and Nathan Appleton, welcomed her, their fourth child, on Nathan's 32nd birthday. In their home, tall, elegant, 54, which you have a picture of, the nursery already was teeming with the energies of Tom, five, Mary, four, and Charles, two. Fanny's father, Nathan Appleton, raised in New Hampshire, had been drawn to Boston for its economic and political opportunities. And he was eager to do his part to build a new nation out of the rubble of the American Revolution. Fanny's mother, Maria, on the other hand, never made the emotional transition to Boston. Her heart was elsewhere in the Berkshires, the western lands her ancestors had pioneered and where she had been born and where she had been married in her parents' house. Throughout her married life, Maria, Maria's happiest time seemed to have been when she crossed the Commonwealth and settled back into the more intimate routines of her natal family privileged country life. So how did these Appletons happen to be here in Boston, living together and often apart? The history I tell you is Fanny's root story. I'm very inspired by Skip Gates' uh, roots program, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Tonight we're actually covering, covering 400 years of history because when we are thinking about Fanny's ancestors, they were already here 200 years before she was born. So that's an important frame to have on this. Um, the stories I tell you, I'm quite convinced Fanny didn't know, but I believe that family stories matter to each of us, and we have a we have sense and we seek to know something about the stuff of which we are made. So let's start with Fanny's Berkshire-born mother. She who preferred to live in the West had an affinity in the West in her roots. Heads up, women's history is challenging. Women's histories are buried in a trail of their husband's names that conceal their identity. This is a very real problem, and this is why so little is known about this remarkable mother. Maria Gold Appleton was a Williams, who would have guessed, right? Nothing in her name says that. Uh, she knew she was a Williams, though she may not have known who the first British Williams was, and that was a native of Norwich, England, who boarded the ship John and Dorothy Ipswich in the spring of 1637. His name was Robert Williams. He came specifically to Roxbury along with his wife, Elizabeth Stallman and their four children, and they began what would be a generations-long migration along the colony later to be the state of Massachusetts. In Roxbury, they planted trees that in time bore their celebrated William's apple. And they produced, according to legend, unusually robust daughters. <laughs> they now, I mean, the stories are amazing. They were like gigantic, mythological. <laughs> <laughs> I love that detail. They married and, like their brothers, kept settling in inland towns that we know as Concord. Newton, Watertown, and West. One Newton descendant in the late 17th century grew up to be the Reverend William Williams, who obeyed the call of the Congregational Church to gather a congregation in Hatfield. You see Hatfield sort of midway on that line from Boston going toward the Berkshires. Um, Hatfield was right on, in the colony's fertile Connecticut River Valley. He and his second wife raised four children out there. Among them was Fanny's great-great-grandfather, Israel Williams. Some of you in this room may have, I did, I, I'm looking at you, Jeff. No, uh, Colonel Williams. Israel Williams was born in 1709. He, like his father, went to Harvard, presumably to follow in his father's footsteps, but he rejected his father's ministerial path. He was drawn to politics 
and in Boston, he preferred to hobnob with British royal officials. Back home in Hatfield, Israel made his mark, prompting King Charles I to reward him by appointing him the hugely responsible job as overseer of the entire West. That's from the Connecticut River Valley all the way to the Berkshires. Now, as Colonel Israel Williams, he took his charge seriously and very personally. He rode west out from the Connecticut River Valley in search of pro propitious sites in which to erect British fortifications. And in the process, this man, who was known as the head and shoulders of the Tory party, also secured for himself large, gorgeous tracts of Berkshire land. <laughs> Colonel Williams' eldest daughter, Sarah, was Fanny's great-grandmother. We're getting close now. <laughs> she was a notably tough-willed woman who famously rejected her cousin's suitor named Ephraim Williams, an extraordinarily wealthy, unattractive relative. <laughs> Instead, in 1759, Sarah chose to marry a man named Paris Marsh. The surgeon Marsh, who it just so happened, had tended to her dying suitor in the French and Indian War. <laughs> Thus it was that Ephraim's Williams' fortune that might have gone to Sarah and her family went to the founding of Williams College. Well, the couple, Sarah and Paris, settled in the farther west, the further west, in a glorious swath of land that I have visited. It actually, the house is still there that they built it, that her father, that Sarah's father, gave them as a wedding present. Here, in land that was still in dispute, called Ashwella equivalent, Paris saw to the building of their home and to convening the founders of the now town of Dalton, which is northeast of the county seat, which is Pittsfield. Any people from no Berkshires from this audience? I know Dalton. Yeah, yeah, good. Here in Ashwell, Ashwell equivalent, a hard name to say, Paris would benefit from another of Sarah's Williams relatives. This was legendary Western-born Colonel Bill Williams, a jovial man, eminent in royal politics, who could see to it that Paris would be appointed to a series of royal judgeships. But when revolutionary activity disrupted British institutions, Paris had no job. In this unsettled revolutionary time, when all were at sea, the Marsh family made their home advantageously sited along the region's major east-west road into a public tavern. They became tavern people. You know, when everybody thinks of uh, the privileged people, there were bumpy times in the road, and this is one of them. Um, In, so, um, Martha, Fanny's grandmother, maternal grandmother, was one of the six Marsh daughters, known as the Marsh beauties, <laughs> who served and chatted with gentlemen travelers who came to eat and drink and dispense and gather news at the tavern. But in 1775, news was not good, especially for Tory, Tories like Sadie's father. Young Martha bettered her fate, this is Fanny's grandmother, by marrying in 1786, <clears throat> not one of the men who came through the tavern, but she married the guy next door. <laughs> it just so happened that he was an attorney who could bring Martha, his attractive, smart, and ambitious wife, to another of his properties in Pittsfield. Here they welcomed their first child, who was Fanny's mother. And listen to her name, Maria Teresa, what's going on here? <laughs> An empress, a European empress. What an interesting thing to think about. 
Um, Mr. Gold, having secured the loyalty of a number of the region's inhabitants when he joined Shays' Rebellion in 1786, built a law practice that became a lucrative enterprise. That success enabled him to launch peripheral businesses, among them a Pittsfield textile mill. All this money enabled the upwardly mobile Golds to appeal, to apply his wealth and their taste on a grand project fashioning out of their once modest farmhouse one of Pittsfield's grandest and most admired Georgian masterpieces. That's on your sheet, the upper right corner. That inside the shell of that grand house is a country farmhouse. And they just kept adding rooms and adding fireplaces and adding chimneys and so it became what you see. I've written about their home improvements in my article called Family Values in the magazine Historic New England, where I show that Fanny Longfellow's delight in her historic house here, Creighton Castle, relates back, harkens back to her maternal grandparents' home improvement. Now let's turn to Fanny's paternal ancestors. The, one who, the ones who bear the name we associate with her, the Appletons. Like those of her mother's line, the Appletons sailed out of England from the same port, Ipswich. But once they arrived, they stayed hugging the coast rather than moving inland. The area they chose to settle had originally belonged to Agawam Indians. But these people were decimated in 1629, <coughs> leaving their chief compelled to sell their land to the Massachusetts Bay Company. And that's how Fanny's fraternal line came to be here. The first Samuel, the New World settler, was an investor in the Massachusetts Bay Company, and he secured his <coughs> land grant in this formerly Indian place, still somewhat Indian place, Agawam. To this place, Samuel brought his first his wife and his five children in the winter of 1636. On once Agawam soil, Samuel and the other British settlers named their place Ipswich. It's the Ipswich we know today on the North Shore, where there is a whole historic um, operation going on. <laughs> um, they named it Ipswich after the port that they sailed from. And like Fanny's mother, his mother's ancestors, her father's ancestors, also took to improve their fortune through politics. But within a century, those 460 acres that Samuel had been granted that was Agawam land no longer sufficed to support his progeny. <laughs> his family needed to survive elsewhere, and that's why Fanny's paternal great-grandfather looked to provide an opportunity, a life raft, for his descendants elsewhere. Unlike those before him who chose to become ship captains, merchants, <coughs> clergymen, Fanny's grandfather, or uh, great-grandfather, already a father of five, saw the wisdom in his forebears having invested in land. Strategically, he eyed 80 western lots of western land. See that upper arrow going west to New Ipswich? Mm -hmm. That land then was claimed, fought over by Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Um, Isaac II, thinking of his descendants, bought up 24 of the 44 lots still available, thus making himself the region's single most powerful man and single Land holder, largest land holder. That's how Fanny's paternal grandfather had a place to go. He traveled west. I love to visualize it. 66 uncharted miles. No roads, no asphalt. You know, trees there. And it's not like there was a clear way. Um, to begin new life in this territory, which um, has been described where community life was minimal, but where the Indian danger had been removed. 
you see the theme. The Indian danger is a very present reality. This new land would be Fanny's grandfather's life raft, and in town where he would drop anchor. He and others who settled the area named it New Ipswich, and by 1759, that just happens to be the year that Fanny's maternal grandparents married. No, drop that. <laughs> in 1759, Fanny's grandpa had cleared his land and built his house. In 1760, he married his wife from Concord, with whom he would produce 12 children. Let's briefly review the remarkable parallels between these pair of predecessors. Both came from an area. This is really extraordinary, and when I found it, I couldn't believe it. They, they, when the mother married the father, they didn't know this. That's what you have to realize, okay? They both, the original settlers from both lines came from within 50 miles of one another in England. Both had left from the same <coughs> British fort to begin their migration to the New World. Once there, both lines descendants prospered, at least until political conflict disrupted the status quo. Land, land distant from the centers of power, allowed both families to minimize disruption and to offer more than 10 children that they had a hedge against the future. That hedge came in the form of the best education available. Fanny's mother, Maria Teresa Gold, and her father, Nathan Appleton, enjoyed the fruits of quite different educational opportunities and Fanny would be the beneficiary of it all. Both, to both sets of grandparents, the very best education, like home improvement and the acquiring of ever finer things, was proof of one's refinement. That proposition Fanny's father would take to heart in his parenting in the second quarter of the 19th century when he wrote his oldest son, Tom, quote, there is nothing more derogatory of the character of a gentleman than bad spelling. <laughs> it looks as if the parents, the father admonished, were not able to send his child to school. Girls, too, needed their ways to be polished. So let's start with Fanny's mother's education. She began at home learning her ABCs and numbers and learning the Bible. Upon reaching the age of 12 in 1798, her father took her to Hartford, Connecticut to board in the highly respected Miss Patton School, which I believe is worth a book in itself. Extraordinary school, but I'm not here to talk about that tonight. For Maria's final training, her father secured an even more ambitious placement. This one was in Boston. It was called the Berry Street Academy. Doug, this is the school we're talking about. It also is worth, its history is worth the book. The school was in the Federal Street neighborhood and had been the pet project of the phenomenally wealthy Thomas Handicide Perkins. When he heard of these distinguished school keepers in New York City, he lured the school's co-directors and their family to his town to enhance Boston's prestige gives his sense of how Boston saw itself, that so one school could be pivotal. Mr. Gold had Maria board with the eminent school's co-directors, Sarah Isaacs, a Jew turned Presbyterian, and William Payne, her congregationalist husband. Together, this couple was instrumental in bringing to their neighborhood, to the Federal Free <coughs> Church, their beloved minister, the Reverend William Ellery Channing, the Unitarian minister. Despite Fanny's mother's, what she called her, their Calvinist roots, Maria embraced the Unitarian church. She, with her best friend, Eloise, the one who sat with her to have her portrait. Um, she was her best friend, Eloise, already a renowned writer, artist, and Latin prodigy, Eloise, 
were among the accomplished young women in the circle of this charismatic pastor. It, thus it was that the highly influential minister in Fanny's mother's life would become so important to Fanny in her own young life. Okay, to Fanny's father's education, this is more, maybe more stuff. Fanny's father's education was an entirely different story. His school's remarkable beginning grew from his father's commitment to create a first-class education for his children living in the New Ipswich wilderness, far from any centers of influence. As an educator, I find this story phenomenal. Along with his region's other ambitious father, Fanny's grandpa set out to build their private academy, New Ipswich Academy, which they modeled on the very first American Academy, Exeter. Fanny's grandpa and the other proprietors published the school's curriculum that included English, Latin, Greek, logic, writing, arithmetic, geometry, and music. And they found one person who could teach them all. <laughs> and he must have been truly extraordinary. Um, there's a lot about him, but I'm not talking about him tonight. <laughs> What's amazing to me and also helps us picture the time, is that the school proprietors, this is Fanny's grandfather and these other guys who started the school, convinced the president of Dartmouth College, which was then new, <coughs> to accept credits earned in their little academy for students that they admitted to Dartmouth College. Now, I want to remind you, look at that piece of paper. Look at that little white house. That's the school I'm talking about. Gets it all in perspective. Okay. Fanny's father, as the ninth child, grew up with his older siblings and a number of other academy males who boarded in the house. Their New Witch with the Appleton's New Witch with home, as one former student recalled, and I love this sentence, was the birthplace of his mind. <laughs> it was life in the home more than even in the school. Here, Fanny's father grew up listening to his father engaged in a dinner table talk with young men, and I'm not making this up. This is a real list of people with names the young men who would become their nation's first generation of professors, authors, judges, inventors, businessmen, legislators, and attorneys. One would be go on to become the president of Bowdoin College, and another would become a governor of New Hampshire. Sets you to wondering. Nathan, at 13, was ready to enter New Ipswich Academy, and although he benefited from the former cur curriculum, it was a skill he learned from a fellow, student, a, a, a fellow student that launched his career. He mastered the art and science of bookkeeping. Nathan, he was a math genius, this little kid. Nathan's older brother, Sam, who opened stores in New Ipswich and in Boston, hired his little mathematician brother <laughs> and persuaded their father to allow the young boy to end, end his formal schooling so he could help him in his Boston business. From his modest Cornhill Boston store, brother, big brother Sam grew his business into an international empire called S. Appleton and Son, which imported British textiles. When Nathan reached the age of 21, Sam made his brother an equal partner in his enterprise. In 1801, mature 21-year-old Nathan set sail for England to do buying goods for the business. But upon landing in Liverpool, the capital of the cotton trade, someone delivered him a message. <clears throat> Urgent. Do not buy. The market is not favorable. Across the Atlantic. There he was. What's he supposed to do? <laughs> Freed of business responsibilities, Nathan spent more than a year improving himself. 
he recorded in his travel journey his many moves across the continent where he attended theater performances in, even if the language one, was one he didn't understand, and he sought out art galleries and museums. In Paris, he visited the just-opened Louvre Art Museum. When Nathan returned to North America, he went south on business. Again, he kept a travel journal, and in this book, he kept comparing East East Coast, each East Coast town to his own beloved Boston. No longer a New Hampshire rustic, when he returned to Massachusetts in 1806, Nathan was ready to marry and start a family. So now we're back to Fanny. We cannot know which of these many family stories she had heard, nor whether we, at least as a child, she heard anything of Nathan's obsession with family history, which is documented. But all this is irrelevant to Fanny's first years. Her attention was fixed, as it is with all children, on the people and the things nearest to her. She knew nothing of her papa's statehouse speech, likely Tommy, and Billy's support for his recent investment in the water rights for the Merrimack River to supply power to the Lowell Mills. That speech, her mother declared to be a good deal more to the purpose than many other such speeches. At home at 54 Beacon, that, that House, the tall, skinny house, okay, was where Fanny was not yet where, at home at 54 Beacon. Fanny, not yet walking, may have seen her papa drafting plans with the famous architect Alexander Paris. He was designing the family's new home at 39 Beacon Street. When that new bigger house was ready, so was Fanny. Her long legs were strong enough to carry her up its granite steps and through that elegant fan glass doorway that I have on the front page. Standing on the black and white marble hallway, looking straight ahead, she saw the grand spiral stairway, which is the masterpiece of that house. And here, too, were those two Gilbert Stewart portraits that you have in your hands. They, like the Appleton family, had moved up close. <laughs> More art came to number 39 in 1822, when Nathan placed eight winning bids on a auction, Boston auction of paintings distributed to European old masters. You have to picture this. Boston, fine European, what they believed to be, and everybody who was anybody wanted to have one of these, or two of them, really. <laughs> He got eight. <laughs> For Maria, the high point of 1822 wasn't the auction, but it was hearing renowned orator and Harvard professor Edward Everett deliver his lecture on Egypt that Maria said was the seat of ancient science and learning and the fine arts. Fanny was ripe to make her own personal encounter with art. In 1825, visiting, she was then not eight, She's visiting her maternal grandparents in the Berkshires, and she wrote about seeing a traveling painting. This is a phenomenon we are not familiar with. We are accustomed to seeing art exhibits with many pieces. In 1825, the big deal was one visiting painting, and it toured, and it toured with a little brochure that told you how to look at it. So the painting that came to Pittsfield in the Berkshires that Fanny saw was Christ rejected. It also was traveling that summer. This large canvas prompted the child to write her first magnum opus, a four-page letter to her big sister Mary, in which she detailed each of the actions of the figures, the actors she saw in the painting. Two years later, in 1827, when Fanny was 10, her access to art significantly expanded. The Boston Athenaeum's Fine Art Gallery opened. It's the precursor to the smooth MFA. And it opened with a radical move. It admitted women, females, female children. Two. This policy allowed Mrs. Appleton to bring her children to see exhibits that her husband, who just so happened to be the chair of the Fine Arts Committee, had helped organize. Here, 
all the family could see the artworks that he and Maria had acquired and were on display. Meanwhile, there was more to learn. Fanny, like her older siblings, began being homeschooled at 39, Beacon, where her mother's priority was the children's faith and their appreciation of art. Nathan's priority was good letter writing, as you've heard before. <laughs> In letters to his chicks, he explained that his older children should teach the younger ones, they should be a team. But that team fractured when Mr. Appleton removed his eldest chick, Tom, from Boston Latin School to install him at what would be what was the Round Hill School in Northampton, another school that deserves a book. Um, this school, Round Hill, Nathan expected would outstrip Boston Latin. Round Hill had been formed by two disenchanted former Harvard professors, determined to challenge what they saw as Harvard's declining standards. <laughs> Crucial to their success was the employing of faculty of Scott a faculty of scholars native to or trained in Europe. Fanny, Mary, and Charles heard all about Tom's school at the breakfast table at number 39 Beacon, where proud Mr. Appleton read Tom's school letters aloud. Tom's writing so favorably impressed the father that soon he would send young Charles to join Tom at Round Hill. Fanny's mother, who loved art, her God and her children, had longed to pour instruction in their minds. But probably she had little to say about their formal education. Perhaps so homesick for her Berkshire family, she begged her father more than once to send one of her younger sisters to Boston so she might guide that sister's schooling. Remember Maria, was the one whom school teacher at Berry Street recognized her as his most extraordinary writing student ever. Now she felt her talents were masked behind obligations, being the manager of social affairs, hosting 200 people at a time for tea, and sitting on boards. She was on two boards. She was in the Widow's Society, and she was a trustee for the society for employing the female poor. I sense in her heart of hearts, Maria felt her own significant gifts were rather poorly employed. Of her marriage, Mrs. Appleton also wrote of her disappointments. Strangely, in writing in an album belonging to her older daughter, she confided, <coughs> confided quote, no one, perhaps even in the happiest marriage, ever found all the qualities she expected to possess. In far too many cases, she finds she has practiced mental deception. Imagine writing this to your daughter. <laughs> and has erected her airy castle of felicity on some rainbow which owed its very existence only to the very peculiar state of the atmosphere. And Despite her many advantages, Maria Appleton, Mrs. Appleton, saw little to like in Boston. And as she confided in her father, after all, in my heart I prefer the home of my childhood. There's too much bustle here. We breathe too much of the city atmosphere. So Maria traveled to Pittsfield and beyond, even astonishing her son Charles when she went, quote unquote, on her own to Niagara. Both of Fanny's parents' travels, in part, provided us the bounty of their letters. Letter writing helped all the four uh, far-flung members of the family be connected, even though, even through their often strained separation. Significantly, after 1830, when Fanny's father was elected to the House of Representatives, Fanny, at 13, made the most of these separations. She appointed herself family reporter. <laughs> she wrote many letters to her papa, revealing a state of her political <coughs> widow mother, and kept detailing her mother's fluctuating health, her despondent spirit, 
and alarming changes in household health. But I'm getting ahead of myself. While Fanny's brothers were at Brown Hill, what schooling were there for girls? Nathan delighted in his older daughter's success at Madame Candace in Boston, where Mary became proficient in French. For younger Fanny, likely both parents concurred on the choice of a school run by devout Miss Elizabeth Palmer Peabody. They knew this teacher. She was a protege of their minister, and she was one of their close-knit, beloved Federal Street and Church community. During Fanny's time at Miss Peabody's from fall of 1825 to spring 1827, that is before Mr. Appleton was elected to Congress and left Boston, parental tensions already were high. One concern was over Fanny's education. Miss Peabody wrote to Mr. Appleton objecting to his demand that Fanny be excused from homework. She all, Miss Peabody also objected to Mrs. Appleton's taking Fanny West to her Berkshires in the summer, causing the child to miss summer school. But the teacher's main concern was what she called Fanny's inattention. On reading this complaint in a letter, Mrs. Appleton, pregnant again, took her pen in hand. She wrote telling the teacher to do whatever she thinks best. But the teacher wrote back not to her, but to Fanny's father. Miss Peabody told Mr. Appleton that Fanny's chief difficulty, it's amazing to have report cards from 1825. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that Fanny's chief difficulty was that she learned too fast, with too much facility, that school just didn't discipline her mind. Her solution was that Fanny would come and stay in the afternoon school when she could give the child more attention. Likely, Miss Peabody knew very well the cause of Fanny's so-called inattention. Everyone in church did, or would have. Almost on Fanny's ninth birthday, Mrs. Appleton, had given birth to a wizened, malformed boy, whom a visiting relative described as a mite of a baby, a droll-looking thing. His hands are not a bit bigger than a wax doll. When he cries, it looks like a white mummy. Four months later, the family, having proposed even naming the baby, who failed to thrive, faced the baby's death. That was before Fanny turned 10. A horrible blow for all. From all I have read, I see Fanny as not having been inattentive, but exceptionally attentive to her brilliant, eccentric, famous teacher. More so than her teacher may ever have imagined. After all, it was Miss Peabody who expected, quote, to count women among cultural revolutionaries giving life to those forms of freedom which Washington and his friends had left to us. I love that quote. <laughs> Miss Peabody foresaw her era's creative work was in forging a new psychological, spiritual, interior revolution, comparable in national importance to the political revolution, the revolution of 17. Stunning idea. These are not my words, this is her words, the teacher's I think Fanny got the message. After the baby's death, after her father's departure to live far away in Washington, Fanny was left alone with anxiety about her mother's depression and terrified at the prospect of losing her mother to the disease that was ravaging her, consumption from which she died in February 1833. We're almost at the end. Fanny sought solace from twin forms of expression, writing and drawing, that comforted her and disciplined her mind. Her many drawing books are proof of hours of copying from drawing books that provided flat two-dimensional forms to copy. That practice gave her skills to look at and draw life around her, trees and people. 
Armed with a pen for letter writing and pencils for drawing, young Fanny was teaching herself essential skills, how to be alone and how to sit with herself. More important work was ahead of her. From that twin practice, letter writing and drawing, Fanny forged a much more intimate form of writing that I refer to as her personal prayers. That work demanded self-seclusion and self-tutelage. Now, personal prayer writing is not like reading prayers from a prayer book. Most of us are familiar with reading prayers and many are uncomfortable with it. Very rare and very precious to this writer, me, is Fanny's writing from the heart, her giving form to her own personal prayers. And that's what Fanny did at 16. Intent on learning who her soul was, she opened a dialogue with God. In the third person, she wrote, quote, Before thee, her heart lies open as a scroll. To thou kind God, she plotted her future plan. Oh, here on this page, my heart, Shalt thou pour out thy sorrows where thou canst be seen by no eye by his who formed thee. And this was just the start. Let's return to early in the talk when I ask you to remember an experience with, associated with God. I asked you to do this because we 21st century <coughs> people may not relate to Fanny's personal prayer writing. Today, the majority conform, conforms to secular, if not avowedly, atheistic thinking. Not so in Fanny's time and in her ancestors' time. Her ancestors' crossing in the 1630s were praying people. Her great-grandfather, the minister in Hatfield, was a praying person. In her parents' letters, we can see each of them writing about their prayer life. So Fanny came to prayer honestly, in her own words, with her own dots and dashes interspersed with quotations. At 16, she felt free to tell God all she wrestled with in utter sincerity. So in closing, let's be with Fanny at 16, seeing her as her brother Charlie saw her. By the way, at this point, he is very sick. He also has consumption and he doesn't live very much long. That's part of the poignance of this. He wrote of her, he said, you're still the infant of the family, but now you're five foot 10 <laughs> with corkscrew curls. You know the Bartolini sculpture in the house with the cork? cork, cork? She had them at 16. And, and then he said, but you are, most of all, you are able and willing to assert your equality in age and station. This assertive Fanny write, wrote her prayers in three different kinds. For praising the Almighty, accepting her not being in control and praising God, God's omnipotence, two, for praising her gratitude for everything she had, and two, pleading for any guidance and strength, she knew she needed it. Fanny wrote in a kind of stream of consciousness writing, thanks to Laura for that association, <laughs> writing for her eyes only, her praises. Thy, and these are her words, thy puttest forth thy might and man is powerless. Thou art too noble and grand to be understood by him. The man, the feeble intellect cannot grasp thy immensity, but overpowered and amazed, she gazes at thee and confesses that naught is higher but him who poured thee from the hollow of his hand and gave thee all thy might. This is a 16-year-old writer. These are not quotations. I've been able to verify which are quotes and which are not. Of gratitude, reeling from her many losses, she wrote, may we all, and this is very poignant to me, she wrote, may we all be very thankful. Remember, this is after everybody's gone. Mother's died, father's gone, brother is going, baby's died. 
May we all be very thankful for the many blessings that have conferred in us, granting us each other for so long. Gratefully, she wrote, then on thee, O God, will I call who art alone able to support my fainting spirit. And it goes on and on. I, I think I'm going to cut telling you all that at the end to the end. My favorite of all Fanny's qualities, the one I admire and perhaps even envy the most, is that she liked to find herself mistaken. She liked teaching herself patience. She wrote, where has fled my imagined fortitude? Where is that philosophy that enabled me so calmly to reason on the right and wrong? Is it possible that I know my heart so superficially? So back to my list of what she was not that I started out with. She was not an author of a great American novel, not a producer of great paintings. She did something exceedingly rare that I hope has engaged you. Trusting that her life was a gift to learn from, she remained always not knowing, never naming the who she was, continually creating tangible traces of her soul that make her psychologically and spiritually accessible as few American Victorians are. By 16, I see her in the process of making herself into one of those brave cultural revolutionaries her teacher, Miss Peabody, foresaw. Already speaking from the heart, mystified, terrified, and always deeply appreciative, Fanny, at 16, was giving life to new forms of freedom, going it alone, and living a religion so large that she dared to love God without a mediator or a veil. Now, I want to explain what that quote is. That without a, loving God without a mediator or a veil is a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson from the Divinity School address that alarmed so many people in this neighborhood. That address was given five years after Fanny wrote this. She was launched at 16, long before she became the catalyst and inspiration that she would become to her poet husband. Thank you. Different people at different times. 
what I left out was that, remember that um, guy in Pittsfield who made all the uh, judge appointments for his relative? He was known to have slaves, numerous slaves. And he all had a very, very, very big house, so big that it could house the court. So the court met in his house with the slaves. Otherwise, there were servants, but the slave thing is explicit in the case of the, the Bill William. He's a fantastic character. He, oh, I have to tell you this. <laughs> it's so funny. He, he wanted to get his relatives to move to the Berkshires. He wanted to get them, get them to come, and many of them did. But he wrote a letter that survives. And what he says, one of the many things he says of why you should move there, is that living in the Berkshires makes women more fertile. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to ask, how did Fanny meet Longfellow? I know that's probably another book, but... It's in a whole other story. It's much later, I mean relatively later. In 1836, there in Europe, he is agreed. She was all set up. Her. Her experience with mourning was perfect for the situation he was in. He was a mourner. He had just lost his wife. Is this the first of a series? Are we, are we going to, like, no. <laughs> first episode? We get another episode? I don't know if it sounds yeah. like um, a <laughs> series. Yeah, I, it, right now, this is it. I'm, I'm writing a book, though, and making this more. Because the frustration of what had to get left out is mm -hmm. not acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Diana, um, of course, Third Night Beacon Street is on the north slope of Beacon Hill. Fanny would have seen daily those folks living on the other side of Beacon yeah. Hill. Does she write about um, interaction? Yeah. Does she write about Robert Roberts, who is their butler? I, I know for a fact that you're correct that he was the butler. I know he fled their house in that terrible year with the, the, the baby. Um, but there is no writing about him explicitly. Mm. That's when he went over to the Gores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the right. Year of the baby. Christopher Gore, yeah. That must have been a very unhappy year, like 39 years. Was there any superstition associated with having a malformed infant? Not that I've ever come on. It's just unspeakable. You get the sense of the unspeakableness of it. That I found that description of that, <coughs> that little description was so precious because there's nothing. Fanny is largely in denial. She's in denial when her mother's dying of consumption. And who in this room doesn't understand that? I mean, we don't want to see it happen in front of our eyes. But she saw it and then she howled. I mean, these prayers are howls. Anything else? <laughs>